don't want to get chased by bugs. <laughs> 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 Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I, I have to. I think the next slide even says it. There we go. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. It's a great day. It's a beautiful day. This Rick, since we've got uh, Aubrey now, I, I was holding her yesterday, and so I was like, yeah, I like the picture. That's a good choice. But I do love this proverb, 22, 6, where it says, direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. They may sojourn away from it for a moment in time, but they do come back. So that's why it's so important. Uh, today, for uh, our sermon today, Pastor Mark's going to be on Lesson 7, which is Sociology and the Divine Imprint. And he, this is going to be a great message, and I'm not even going to delve into it because I, I know he's got a wonderful message for us. Um, but we do have some announcements uh, for us this morning. <laughs> there we go. Next week, Unio Mystica, Am I Alone? And so... Uh, we invite you to join us next Sunday for the sermon and the following Wednesday then for the study on that, um, as we'll be doing Sociology of the Divine Imprint this Wednesday night. So join us for that. Um, I think this video is, what, about 50, 55 minutes for Wednesday night? So and then we'll have a discussion and time of prayer after that. So uh, join us for that. If you've missed any of it, let us know because we'd like to catch up. So... Uh, let's see here. What's up next? And oh, we have a movie. We're gonna play the trailer of this movie at the end of the service. Um, for those of you watching online, go out to Grace Street Church, Grace Street dot Church. Get it right. And in the upper right hand corner, yeah, because this your upper right hand corner. But if you're on mobile, hit the hamburger menu, which is the three horizontal lines, and select Grace Street Cinema. When you tap on that, it's going to bring up that page, and immediately on that page will be the trailer for the movie. So we invite you to join us for that. It's free on July 2nd. Doors will open at 5.30, and then the movie at 6. If you need a reminder for yourself or a bookmark for your Bible, we have tickets over there. They aren't needed, 
but you can also grab a stack and take them and invite somebody else to come with you. So great time to have that. What we basically turn this, this is such a versatile space, right? Today it's a worship space. Last Saturday it was a Hot Wheels track. And on July 2nd, it will be a movie theater. I don't, you can't see it online, but right up there, I'm pointing at things that people online can't even see. There's a uh, projector, and then what is over there, which is the windows. You know what? Here we go. Let's have some fun. <laughs> right over there at the window. There we are. That whole window gets filled up by a screen. It's 12 foot in diagonal. So it take we get a big picture and we have some great surround sound courtesy of pastor mark and we will enjoy that movie I think of a wedding that night. The, the fun part about this space too is that i can run to the back of the sanctuary or the back of our worship space and do things like that and then the following saturday on Jul uh, july 9th we will have our if I'm not mistaken, it's the 159th race of Orange Track Racing our seven, in our 17th season of that. So we do invite you to join us for that as well. It's a great time. We have kids of all ages. Um, the younger kids tend to, the last time they got into this whole deal where they were playing on the carpet, we have a, a couple of cart pieces of rug that have roads on it, you know, like kids like to play on. Pretty soon they moved those aside and they were racing their cars across the carpet and they were racing for pinks. <laughs> Whoever won got the other person's car. I was like, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> they were having just as much fun doing that as they were in actually with the races that day. So, hey, you, you just have some fun, right? So jo uh, join us for that. All right, well, before we go into our call of worship this morning, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, thank you for this beautiful weekend that you have given us. Father, the sun is out. There's no rain today in the forecast. The temperatures are to be wonderful for us to be outside today. Let us enjoy the day, but Father, today is a day where uh, we also celebrate fathers. And for those who don't have a father or didn't have that father figure in their life, Father, we just want them to know that they can turn to you for that. And we thank you that you can be that father if they didn't have that. For those that, that did have that father figure in their life that was there for them, we thank you for those fathers and for what they did and bringing up their children alongside their wives. Father, as you, we prepare to hear your word this morning, let it be all about you. Let us hear the message in this this message of divine imprint, this message that talks about structure, and this, this message that talks about wisdom and your ways, Father. We just thank you for this message. We thank you for the word that you've given to Pastor Mark. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our scripture this morning comes from James chapter 3, and it is verses 13 through 18. So if you have your Bibles, please open up and join me. I'd tell you what page to go to, but my Bible is not the same as yours. So I'll let you catch up there. But this is a wonderful uh, piece of scripture. And we've just come out of a passage in chapter 2 where James taught us that faith without works is dead. So listen to what he continues on here. and says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous, and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder in every kind of every kind now I want you to hear these final two verses because this is this is the wisdom that we get from God and, how, and James does a wonderful job of explaining this right here he says this but the wisdom from above is first of all pure 
It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is also always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Did anybody else hear 1 Corinthians 13 in there? No favoritism and is always sincere. These verses tell us that true wisdom only, only comes from God. And that it is, you know, like I said, James taught us about faith without works is dead in the, in the previous chapter. But here he teaches us that godly living only comes through wisdom. Wisdom and godly living go hand in hand just as works of faith do. And I think it's very important to remember that. And if you remember, in my studies every morning, I'm reading, uh, I just finished First and Second Samuel, I'm into uh, First Kings, and I'm reading about Solomon, so he's top of mind for me this morning. And what did he do when God asked him what he wanted? Did he ask for money, fame, power, wisdom? wisdom. He asked for wisdom. And he was wise already just to ask for that, because what did God do at that point? He showed him the way, and he provided him the things that he needed to rule with wisdom. This passage also tells us that we need to have a gentle and humble spirit, because those are signs of that wisdom. That is godly living. That jealousy and selfish ambition, that keeps us from that wisdom. I see this at work all the time. People are jealous of somebody else's position. People are, uh, or, or that selfish ambition where they want to get something and they want it for themselves and not for anybody else. This is worldly wisdom and it stands in stark contrast to godly wisdom. It is deceptive and it leads us down the wrong path. Open your hearts right now to hear the message that God has given to Pastor Mark. Father, thank you for this message we are about to hear. Thank you for this message on wisdom and structure, Father, that through living a godly life, we gain wisdom. But, Father, we need to be reminded that in order to get that, we need to be in your word each and every day. We're doing that here in just a moment. Father, thank you for the word that you've given to Pastor Mark. Let us hear it. Let us meditate on it. And let us act on it as we move forward each and every day from here on out. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> well, thank you, Pastor Dre. Welcome, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Wow, this is pretty hot from the other day. Uh, we were out, we had the privilege of being out at Kirkwood. Uh, on Tuesday to do the flag retirement ceremony and a tribute to all the fallen veterans from the area here. Uh, we read over 170 names Tuesday night and it was really wonderful to be able to see uh, that the families of some of the veterans that were there, how moved and touched they were that we would do this. And uh, it's, it's our great pleasure to do this. This is the 12th year of doing this. For us, and so it's an absolute honor to be able to go out there and do that. Um, and so, yeah, that was a little bit loud because we were broadcasting out in the middle of the parking lot of Kirkwood Community College, and we had to kind of crank up the volume a bit. So, well, happy Father's Day to everybody. Uh, this is a wonderful day, a day to celebrate. I got to celebrate Father's Day yesterday with my son and my grandson. The other son's out in California, so I didn't make it all the way out there, but. Uh, and I get to see my daughter this afternoon. So uh, it was a wonderful time. I don't get to see my grandson enough. And I'll tell you what, they just like, every time you see them, they grow like crazy. They're growing like weeds. So, uh, but it was a wonderful time to be able to get together and uh, just share that time and share that bonding, that fatherly bonding and grandfatherly bonding as well. So for today, for Father's Day, um, I wrote up a, a couple little things, and I've got a really nice poem for fathers, kind of like what I did for Mother's Day. 
And it's no secret that children observe and copy the behaviors that they see in their parents. And Christian fathers, Christian fathers, we have an immense responsibility of demonstrating the heart of God to our children. And we got to make sure that we do that. It's our responsibility to bring God into their lives as fathers. They also have the great privilege, Christian fathers do, of leaving behind a spiritual legacy. So, fathers, it's a solemn responsibility, yet it's a great joy to lead the family in the same way our Heavenly Father leads us through our daily lives. And so, I want you to kind of think about that as you're going through the life. What legacy are you leaving behind with your children? Because it's very, very important. We need to leave that legacy of love and Christ. But this poem sums it up pretty well. God took the strength of a mountain, the majesty of a tree, the warmth of a summer sun, the calm of a quiet sea, the generous soul of nature, the comforting arm of night, the wisdom of the ages. The power of the eagle's flight, the joy of a morning in spring, and the faith of a mustard seed, the patience of eternity, the depth of a family need. Then God combined all these qualities when there was no more to add. He knew his masterpiece was complete, and so he called it Dad. After Father's Day, Dad. Dad's back there. So today, as we celebrate Father's Day, we need to celebrate all those things that God has put in our lives to be able to give to our children, to be able to leave a legacy for our children. And so as this kind of ties in, we were talking about the message and the call to worship this morning from James, and it talked about that wisdom and that wisdom that, that we can pass down, the wisdom that we get from God, from God's Word, from studying God's Word and being in God's Word together. And so we have a little, uh, a little trinket here that Terry wants to pass out for Father's Day to all the fathers. But it's, it's a good reminder of, for dads and uh, what we have going on. So today we continue in our series on the Truth Project, and we're on tour number seven. And tour number seven is on sociology, the divine imprint. So when you hear that word imprint, what do you think of first up? Kind of think of the word stamp. So God put his stamp on a behavior pattern, on the structure, on the design, on the creation of the world. And so sociology is the study of structure of our human society. So as we think about that, and if God put his stamp on it, then God has a social world order under him and under his rule and under his guidelines. So in any structure, we have to have some kind of design. We have to have planning. And in our family structure, the father is the pillar of that family. In our church structure is God is the father figure and he is the pillar of our church. And in created order, order and structures, God has put his divine stamp on all of that structure, on all of that order, and in all of that design. So in Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, God gives us the instructions on that structure of the family and in the church. And it says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means to submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband, he is the head of his wife, and as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. 
Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two unite to be as one. This is a great mystery, but it's also an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, a man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So in this study of sociology, we find ourselves in, in the midst of another dichotomy. You know, we, we, we always have this cosmic battle, this struggle going on. And the cosmic battle in, in the definition of society and what we have in sociology today, Webster's defines sociology as the study of the development, the structure, and the functioning of human society. But if you look at the worldview, and, and I went into study.com, and this is where a lot of the schools point the students nowadays, whether it's high school students, grade school students, or college students, study.com. So study.com put their own twist on what sociology really is. And it really tells us something very, very different. Sociology includes studying racial issues, gender dynamics, phenomena, and feelings around entertainment, the structure of different social institutions and the development of different social movements. Quite a bit different from what that definition of sociology was before. The world has pushed their agendas into that definition of what sociology is. And so when we come at it from a Christian world perspective and we look at it from the worldview perspective over here, we have two different definitions of how things are divine. So what a difference. They took that structure and development which takes careful thought and planning, being ordained by God the Creator, and replaced them with feelings, emotions, and philosophies, not to mention agendas. So how'd this happen? Why did it happen? Well, it happened because we removed God's structure. See, God put in place a set of morals and a moral structure in our society. And he put in consequences for our acts, sins, that we commit. Because they interfered with the I am my own God philosophy. And the mantra is, why should I submit to something or someone I can't even see? and have them rule my life. I'm in charge of my own destiny. If it feels good, I should be able to do it. After all, when I die, I'm just worm fodder. Just feed through the worms. So if you have that kind of mentality, that kind of philosophy, that kind of mantra that you're following in your life, you're gonna have a very hollow, a very shallow life. And when it comes to the end, you have nothing left, nothing whatsoever. And see, that's in stark contrast to what the Christian worldview is. Our call to worship this morning lays it all out. For if you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you're bitterly jealous, there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, it is full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism, and it's always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. 
I love that translation because it speaks to exactly what God's social order was for the world. If you follow the wisdom that God puts in his word, then you're not going to be led astray and you will have order and structure in your life. And as a society, we will have order and structure within our society. If we, if we simply look back about 70 years and you see the, the rapid decay of social order and morals, and we were a moral and just society for the most part, there's always been conflict in the world. But if we take a look back and we look at the social decay that's happened, the dumbing down of our morals, the removal of God from practically everything, you'll see that that disorder and that evil of every kind is becoming more and more and more prominent. I'll get to that in a minute. But see, what a contrast when we, when we think of that world order definition and we think of what God's order is. We need to get the lost people to read this and bring purpose back into their lives. They need to get back on track. And the sad part is they don't even understand that they're lost to start with. So most people go around thinking, hey, everything's just copacetic. Everything's just great for me. And they're stumbling through life. They're just simply wandering through life and trying to be gods themselves. And, uh, you know, stumbling along and not knowing what their purpose in life is, is no way to live a fulfilled life. You can't have a fulfilled life if you're just kind of stumbling through and making it through each and every day. Because God created you with a purpose in mind. He has a plan for your life. And if you don't listen to what he has to say, you're never going to be able to work out that plan. You could be living a whole different luxury life. When I say luxury, I mean having a fullness of life. Not having all the stuff and the material stuff in the world. But having that luxurious life. That life of spirit joined together with others with a common goal and a common purpose in our hearts. So stumbling through life is not how we were created. Stumbling along was not what God had his plan for anyone in the world. That's not the world God created for us. So what happened? What happened to all that? Well, in short, the fall. That all started back at the fall. I'll take talk about that more in a minute. In God's world, the scriptures tells us of an orderly world with rights and responsibilities. Genesis tells us of the world that God designed for us, the world he created for us. And what else? Well, if we take a look in Genesis 2, 15 through 22, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend it and watch over it. It was virtually paradise. Perfect in every way. God created it that way. All we had to do is obey and everything would have had, we, we, we would have had a wonderful, luxurious life in that Garden of Eden. But the Lord God warned them, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if you eat of this fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all of the wild animals and all the birds of the skies. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all of the wild animals, but still... There was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God took, caused the man to fall into a very deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. Did you hear what it said in there? So they created everything, and he brought man and in. Man named all of the animals, and it was a good world, but he was alone. God created us to be in communion with each other. We are meant to be in a community with each other. 
So God said, it is not good. Genesis 2.18. So why wasn't it good for man to be alone? Because we need to be social beings in community with each other. This became the beginning of our social order, the family unit. As we look at our society, the triune structure was stamped upon social order from the very beginning. Structure, design. Any of this sound familiar? If you're going through the Truth Project study, this sounds really familiar because we've been studying that now for the last eight weeks already. Yeah. Um, it is awesome to be able to understand what God created, why he created it, how he created it, and what our role is in it. Guess what? He's pointing out to us what our purpose is in our life. And so many times we see people stumbling through life and they have no idea what their purpose is in life. So God, everything is created to the glory of God. To bring honor, praise, and glory to God. Structure, purpose, design. Nothing is happenstance with that. So when we take a look at that, we take a look at that triune nature, that imprint that God has uh, placed on every living thing in the order <coughs> of everything that he has created. And it all started with this perfect unity, relationships, equality, roles, authority, submission. And I want to talk about that word submission in a little while. But if you take a look in here, the Father created the Son. The Son is in submission to the Father and all that he says and all that he does. And we see that in the scriptures. And it's pointed out in the scriptures right over here. We see the Son who is also in unity with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in unity with the Father. The three work together in community with each other. A social imprint of the divine stamp. And the scriptures tell us how and why. So everything God created has that divine stamp. Everything. But let's take a look at that word submit. Because to most people anymore, the word submit is kind of a negative connotation to something. Well, it used to mean we yielded our will to another authority. And if we take a look at this, Jesus yield his will to the Father. He said, if not my will, but yours be done. So it used to be we would openly and freely submit our will, and it was an act. It was an act that allowed us to submit to that authority. It was an act of love. It was an act of respect. And it's part of that order design and why we were created purposefully. In the biblical sense, it's a very good thing when we submit our will to another authority, to God's authority. But see, the evil in this world have distorted that term submit to mean something very, very negative. Subjugation, that act of submitting against our will, is the action of bringing someone or something under the domination or control. So when we think of submit, most people automatically trip over to subjugation. Somebody's going to make us submit to something, whether we want to or not. Where it used to be, we yielded our will to somebody freely and openly, out of love. There's two different meanings here. Again, we're back to that dichotomy. Two very different meanings. One is to yield freely and openly. And the other means that our rights are being taken away from us. So when we read this passage in Ephesians and we're taking a look at this and we're going, wives, submit to your husbands. The wives are going, why? That's not a good thing. But see, it really truly is if you look at it in the correct perspective. From a biblical sense, it makes perfect sense for that wife to submit because it's my job to take care of my wife and my family. I am that pillar on which the family is built. It's my responsibility. Remember what I told you about the rights and responsibilities? Well, here it is. 
It's our rights and responsibilities as fathers to take care of our family, to bring them up properly. What did I read to you at the very first part? We leave our spiritual legacy in doing so. It's all tied together. So when we look back at the passage in Ephesians, you hear right away that term submit. Some people just kind of freeze up. But it has that complete different meaning from that term subjugation. And the reason why is because it brings in two points that the world order does not bring in. Love and respect. So when we read those two terms in there, we can't be subjugated out of love and respect. You can't have love and respect and subjugation because you're taking something from somebody not freely and openly giving it. So our family, the husband, the wife, and the children, father, husband, wife, and children. So the wife is to submit to the husband and the children submit to the wife. They submit to the husband as well and it brings that divine stamp of order, design, and purpose to the family. So if the wife is submissive to the husband, the scriptures tell us that we become one, just as the Father and the Son are one. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And if we read that passage again, and, and we take a look at it, that passage tells us that a man is, is to leave his family and a wife to leave her family. They are joined together to become one. That's that divine social order, the structure. That divine stamp. So we need to understand that you cannot separate these things in a godly world order. We need to have those things present in order to have a stable family. Okay. So what happens if the family is out of harmony, is, is no longer sta stable? That social harmony is gone within that relationship. Well, then there's no balance left in that family. The families are literally torn apart. Take away one of the parents, no harm away. Take away the love or the respect, no harmony. God's design works when we all do our part. Because when we do, that's what brings the harmony into that relationship. We all have to be working together. We all have to submit together. <clears throat> I'm going to stop here real quick, and I want to pray for you, Steve, because I can see that you're hurting. Steve had a procedure earlier this week, and I'm, it's awesome you're here with us. But Father God, we lift up Steve to you right now. I can see the pain in his in his eyes and on his face, and Lord, we just ask for your care and comfort to surround Steve at this very, very moment. Yes. He's our, one of the members of our family, and we have to take care of our family. It's part of our right and responsibility. So, Lord, we lift Steve up to you right now. Give him respite care. Give him peace. Calm his spirit. Calm those things in his body that are causing him pain, Lord. Yes. And, Lord, we just ask for a, a miraculous and a speedy healing for Steve at this point in time right now. And we submit these things to Christ, and we claim them as a victory in his name. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I just had to do that because I've been... <laughs> I, I'm feeling your pain from here and I, I, I hate to see you in pain uh, we love you and we care about you so as a church what a segue so as a church <laughs> we have Christ at the top of the church we have the leaders in the church and we have the flock or the congregation out here and the church is submissive to Christ the leaders are submissive to Christ the flock is submissive to Christ Yet we all work together in unity with one another as a family unit to become a whole in order for us to work together and to be what God wants us to be as a church, his body. We have to all work together. We all have to be in harmony with one another. We all have to work together to do God's work and he will bless us in that process. And that's all part of that harmony and balance that we need. 
So when we take a look at our social structure of our world today, it consists of three realms, and we have this physical realm, we have the spiritual realm, and we have the social realm. So sociology speaks pretty much to just that human aspect of how we act and react with one another, how we act and react as a community as a whole, and how we come together or split apart as a world. If we act with the wisdom of God and if we act under the order of God, guess what? We have that harmony and we have that balance throughout our social order, our social structure. So God's use of structure in all of these things is apparent all the way down to the very minute, most minute items that you can get. And I'm going to go all the way down to the building block of the atom. The atom is that building block of everything. You've got atoms of all sorts in everything around us. Everything is composed of those atoms. So one single atom is made up of three parts. We have the proton, the neutron, and the electron. And the proton has a positive balance. The electron has a negative balance. The neutron has no charge whatsoever. But the three together in harmony become what's called an atom. And those atoms are the building blocks. You see the structure? You see the design? So the three together are in equal portion to each other. And when they are, when that negative balance and that positive balance are in, in harmony with each other, when they're in balance, they become stable, okay? And it takes all three to be in balance. Now I could go into discussions on covalent bonding and all the rest of the nuclear physics that goes along with it, but that's for a different time to study. <clears throat> so when we take a look at things, all of these things have to be in perfect balance and structure. And if not, then chaos ensues. And it's the same thing in our social structures as it is in our physical structures. God's divine structure is stamped on everything that he has created. What happens when you take one of the elements out of the structure? Well, in the atomic or nuclear world, if we want to go there, if we make those structures unstable, then massive chaos ensues. And that's called, uh, it's called either fission or fusion, depending on which way we're going. And it becomes a breakdown of that intended order. Uncontrolled fusion leads to what developed into what we use for atomic energy and to the atomic bomb. It can and will cause destruction, if not properly applied. If we keep everything in harmony and balance, however, it purrs along really, really nicely, and we don't have to worry about it. See, and when we think about that, if we take any part of our elements, of our structures apart, and we apply that to our relationship, our roles in society, our authority, and our submission and unity within those social spheres, it leads to the same thing. Either if we keep them in balance, we will have harmony and balance. But if we upset that balance or structure, then it leads to chaos and destruction. Take a look at society today. Are we in balance? Are we following God's structure? I think we're out of balance. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit, yeah, a lot. Um, see, that's why in God's word, it tells us to love and respect each other. In that verse in Ephesians, it tells us that husbands were to love our wives and to respect our wives, and wives you're to submit to your husbands in the same way that God does to his church, that the Lord does to his church, which is out of love, respect, honor. And so if we keep those things in balance and you do it with respect and out of love, then everything is going to be in balance and in harmony. The example Jesus set for us, if we think about it, you know, when 
evil was coming against him or wrong was being done against him, he did not retaliate, but he tried to keep everything in balance with peace, love, and respect. He wouldn't participate in the evilness of it. He wouldn't answer the questions that he knew were going to be posed against him as tricks to try and throw him off, to try and change that balance and that harmony and that order. He would not participate in it. And I think as humans today, when we see the evil that's going on in the world, we need to make sure that we're not participating in that evil. Don't return evil for evil. We need to have love and respect. And that's the hard part. So I want to talk about the importance in that structure then of our relationships. And you might have heard the saying, happy wife, happy life, right? Well, <laughs> what happens when you dis disrespect your wife? My wife's sitting back there and she's going, hey, hey. Okay. Well, it ain't a happy life. I can tell you that right now. We need to preserve that harmony in our relationships. We need to use that model that God showed us through his son, Jesus. So we need to make sure that we do everything, treat our wives with love and respect, treat our relationships with love and respect. And we have to be able to do that in the way that Jesus showed us. He gave us a living example of how to walk and talk and treat others in his life and in his world. We need to do the same. Okay, so let's take a look at the world around us. Not a happy place. We have divisiveness, lies, senseless murder, chaos. So what happened to break that harmony that we had? That peace, that paradise that God created for us. When I read those verses in Genesis, that design that I spoke of earlier in the Garden of Eden, well, what happened? We disrespected God. Disobedience, disrespect. We disobeyed what he told us. Sin. We broke the bond between God and man. And that's what we call the fall. When we go against God's divine stamp and his created order and we, we try and go our own way and we listen to that voice we shouldn't listen to that's speaking in our air. Did he surely say that you would die if you eat? And that lie that, that crept in at that point in time set the fall of man and allowed him to be disrespected and it allowed him to be disobeyed. See, Satan got his way through a lie. Relationships were severed, damaged between God and man and man and man in the process, and man and creation. We were no longer in harmony. We were no longer in balance. We broke that structure, that divine structure. So we were broken, separated from God and each other. Shame came in along with guilt and remorse. And I remember what God said earlier that he created that perfect place, no shame, no guilt. We had a perfect relationship with God and with one another. We didn't even know they, they, they had no clothes because they had no shame. There was no negativity there. It was all a perfect union and a perfect society. In the fall, we isolated ourselves from God and we were cast out and made to suffer. That's when all that negativity started. We were together, but alone. I want you to think about that. And I'm sure everybody can kind of relate to that. At some point in time, you've been in a crowd of people, but you felt very alone. You didn't belong. You were cast out. And it's not a pretty place to be. Aloneness, as God said, it was not good. In Genesis, he said, Genesis 2.18, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. So as aloneness is in contrast, it's contrary to what God's very nature is. In all eternity, there had never been aloneness before. 
There had never been aloneness before. See, God was hurt. He was angry. He was betrayed. And I got to ask you something. How would you feel if the perfect creation that you created, the thing that you loved the most, according to the scriptures, the thing you loved the most disobeyed you, betrayed you? Ever been hurt by someone? Betrayed by someone that you loved? See, there's no other type of hurt that compares to that hurt. It goes down to the very fiber of our being. And that's happened to many of us. Sometimes right in our own churches. That's happened to many of us. And it's not easy to get over that kind of hurt. Some people never do. Some never return to church for the rest of their lives. I can name probably a dozen people right off the top that I know were hurt by someone or something in the church. And see, that not only separated themselves from the church, but they've now separated themselves from God. They've separated themselves out of that community, and they're stumbling through life lost, alone. They may have others around them, but they're not in community. They're not in harmony. They're not in balance. They're outside of the structure that God created for their lives and for the plan for their lives. So did God leave us that way? No. What did he do then? Well, he let man survive by himself for a little while. <coughs> if we read on in Genesis in there, boy, that did not turn out good. Genesis 6 tells it quite well. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe this human race that I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, all the large animals, all the small animals that scurry along the ground. And even the birds of the sky, I'm sorry, I made them all. Ever been in that place? Ever felt that way? When you've been hurt and betrayed that bad by someone or something that you love, you get angry. And you want to destroy. So is that what God did? Well, kind of. But see, when God is removed for a world, it falls into chaos and it becomes an evil place. Look around our world today. It's the product of agendas and out of touch philosophies. Chaos, murder, evil. Wow. See, God had loved man, but man broke his heart. He created that perfect place for him. He created a perfect planet for him to survive on and thrive on. His own creation had turned evil. But God had a redemption plan even then. Let's look at that last line in the passage. But Noah found favor with the Lord. And with Noah, he put that redemption plan into play. That's another the point is, in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of the anarchy, God was still willing to give us another chance. It's called love. Love that a father has for his children. That love, then the children should return to the father. On this Father's Day, we celebrate fathers, some good, some not so good. Grandfather stepfathers who step up and step in to be that father figure to bring order back into broken families and broken lives mm -hmm. broken relationships and just like God we see not everything in the world is that bad I'd like you to come Wednesday and hear the rest of the story let us pray dear God give us a life of faith that is devoted to you we want to have a heart that pursues you before anything else. 
And you said, if we seek you with all our hearts, we will find you. Help us to keep our focus on you and on your will. Align our will with yours. Help us to submit freely and openly our will to yours. Thank you, Lord God. Help us not to fall into that temptation and sin that would separate us from you. Forgive us for the time that we've stumbled along our way. And we thank you for your forgiveness and your love. We want to change and live by your way, Lord. You are merciful. And we know that you will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. I pray that you would provide a way out for us when we face those temptations and the courage to turn away from it. Whenever temptation and sin knock on the door, help us to focus instead on your goodness and your love so that we can resist those temptations that come our way. Lord, we pray for strength whenever we face difficulties, times that would seem to overwhelm us. We want us to be reminded that you are there. We are never alone in you, Lord. We lift each other up and we lift each worry and burden up to you because we know you're greater than anything we might face. Remind us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. May we gain strength from doing things that bring you joy. We pray that you would help us to live that life of discipleship, of discipline. Teach us how to be a good steward and guard the minutes and hours that you've entrusted us with so that we can use our time wisely. We can employ your wisdom in our lives and in the world around us. We pray that the desires of our hearts will be aligned with yours so we can shed any unhealthy habits that we have. Thank you for being our strength protection, and provider, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray today. Amen. So, last night at the Balloon Glow, God decided to give me a little lesson on wisdom and relying on him. We had parked at the old Dairy Queen. I call it the old one because it's got a big black spot on the back side of where they had their fire. And we walked down to Jones Park for the balloon glow. And I had taken my glasses off and I was wearing my shade, my sunglasses, and they were sitting in this pocket. We walked around and finally found a place where we were gonna set them down and chairs are all set up. We go to sit down and I pull out my glasses to look at my phone to check something on it real quick and they weren't there oh, no. so in my worldly state using worldly wisdom I walked all the way back to the car and then I walked all the way back to where we were sitting and then I had a little pity party that I can attest to that and then I just said God you know what? that's your will whatever I'll just go to the doctor and we'll get some new ones we got an old frame, I can go get the scripts updated and get the, use those. Mm -hmm. And within minutes, the man goes, where'd you go? <laughs> the Holy Spirit just lifted me up out of my seat, told me to walk 15 feet behind us where we had started and we were going to initially set our chairs down. Mm -hmm. And there, unbroken but slightly disfigured, oh. were my glasses. The nose pieces on them aren't perfect. But in God's wisdom and relying on God instead of ourselves, that's where we can get. That's all I can think of. As Mark was preaching this morning, it's like, we just said, we, even as pastors, we do that. We forget to rely on God and to use his wisdom. This morning, the scripture I want to use as we uh, take communion comes out of Matthew 26. And this, this is after Jesus has just told the disciples that one of them is going to turn on him. 
And as I think about that passage and every time that I read it, that one of them is going to turn on him. One of them is going to betray him in some way or another. Well, last night I felt like I betrayed him by not honoring him and relying on him. So I, I can speak, I'm not going to speak for anybody else. I can speak for myself. When those things happen, when those times happen, I feel like I have betrayed him. But then he moves on. And as they were eating, the scriptures tell us, Matthew records this. He says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it into pieces and he gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it. For this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. And then he ends up with this by saying, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The body of Christ broken for you. Take it. When the blood of Christ shed for you, take it. I think it's appropriate that here in a moment we're going to do the same thing that the disciples did after the meal. It may not be hymns, but we're going to sing. Scriptures tell us that they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Well, we're going to have the prayers for the people, and then we will have a time of worship where we can also sing. Father God, we just thank you for what this meal represents, that each time that we come together, we can be reminded of what your son did for us, that he, above all else, above anything that he needed or wanted, he did this for us. Thank you for what this meal represents, Father, in Jesus' name. Steve this week and this morning Mark thank you so much he had a procedure done at the hospital and he's uh, in some pain but he's here so praise God you know you're moving and, and doing all things so and, and um, I was on the prayer chain this morning and saw that we needed prayer for a few people is there Jim Cheney is one of them a friend of Diane's and Mark's and I don't know what happened but we will pray for him anyway and and um, is there anyone else that would like prayer this morning? Uh, friend Alicia, that she just recently became homeless. Just we keep her in prayer. Oh goodness. Okay. Yes, we will. All right. I'm so sorry. Anyone else this morning? Okay. Well, Father God, we lift up. Alicia, I pray for her, Father God. I pray you will put people in her path, Christian people, that will give her comfort and a, a place to live. Help her to find a shelter, Lord God. Help her to find a shelter in Cedar Rapids or Marion or wherever she is at. And um, bring her back to you, Father God. Lift her up, keep her safe, protect her at all times. In Jesus' holy name. And Father God, we lift up Bruce and Stephanie as they lost their mother, Sherry, this week. We pray for the love of Jesus be with them and give them peace that passes all understanding. And we thank you for that, Jesus. 
We pray for Jim Cheney and his family. Father God, I lift him up and uh, that you will put your loving arms around him and his wife and their family and heal his wounds by the blood of Jesus. Please heal and restore Jim Cheney back to health, Lord God, quickly. As you are the physician, you are the great physician, and only you can heal him. By your stripes, he will be healed. In Jesus' name. Father God, we want to thank you and praise you today for comfort, peace, joy, love of friends and family. Thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit, that you call, on, call us your children. You walk with us, you talk with us, you live within us, and you are alive in us, and you dwell in us daily. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is the most beautiful and precious gift, freely given to those who ask. You said, if we ask, we shall receive it. If we knock, the door will be open. Let us pray for Grace Street Church, that you embold your Holy Spirit to move within our church and all churches in this world that belong to you, Father God. Make us into a mighty army. Help us to spread your word and do your will and not our own. Open the eyes and minds and hearts of your young and old people to hear and read your word. Put Christian people in their path to place a seed in their minds, that you will grow that seed into a, a life seeking and knowing you. Bring America back to you, O oh God. We desperately need your help. Please forgive us and restore us from our sins. We are not worthy of you, Father God, but you love us anyway. And through the blood of Jesus, you can and will cover, cover us from all our sins if you so choose. If we boldly come to you and seek you for all things. You are such a gracious God, full of mercy and grace. We praise you for who you are, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Prince of Peace, God of all, in Jesus' holy name, Father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we worship you today and praise you for everything, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. Well, this brings us to the point in time when we close out our online portion of our service today. Uh, we've included the links for the songs that we're going to be playing up next, and we uh, encourage you to join along with us. Uh, let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of all creation, and we praise you and thank you for that. We, we bring honor and glory to you, Lord, by our lives, and help us to do so and keep us on the straight and narrow path so that we can bring glory and honor. You have given us that divine stamp that you've put on our hearts to our very soul, to our very being, Lord. And we praise you and thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you provided a way out from that separation from you through your son, Jesus, through his blood and by his word. Lord, we are brought back into a right relationship with you. Help us to maintain that right relationship by staying in your word, by being in communion with our church, the body of Christ, and Lord, by being in communion with you in prayer each and every day. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us the blessings that you do each and every day. We lift up those who were lifted up in prayer both silently and aloud and Lord, we ask that you would do a mighty act in their lives, whether it's due to loss of a family member or due to health issues or problems. Lord, for those who are just stumbling and lost, we, we ask that you would help us to bring home that one back to the 99 so they would no longer be lost and so they would be in harmony and balance in their life. Thank you, Father God, in all these things. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.